So as Imens greatly introduced, uh, well, Pascal al already announced the Nestle commitment this morning. So you can see we already greatly engaged at uh, all the level of the supply chains, but we wanted to give you some more concrete examples of what Nestle is doing and is projecting to do. From the very origin of Nestle, we started transforming raw perishable ingredients into shelf-stable products. This is the core of our business. We started back in 1867 when Henry Nestle developed the first infant formula powder. At the time, milk was, could not make it to the cities. We've done that uh, more than 80, uh, 80 years ago almost uh, with Nescafe to cope with the surplus of green coffee beans in Brazil. But in addition of this core business, what else do we do? It starts at the field, in our R&D center, in uh, Tours, we use marker-assisted breeding to develop plantlets, coffee and cocoa plants that are disease resistant, that give higher yields and, and give better productivity. By 2020, 220 million of these plantlets, coffee plantlets, will have been distributed to the farmers. At a broad scale, we engage with the farmers in training them. There's numerous training schemes on place in Africa, uh, but also newly in, uh, in China, on milk and also on cereal. What we'd like to do is really improve the farmers' um, agricultural skills, improve their productivity, so that they can gain insight into producing you know, high-quality materials sustainably. All this contributes to lower the pre-harvest losses, but also the post-harvest losses as they gain understanding on how to, to store uh, the, the crops better, etc. This example is for Pakistan. This is our largest dairy market. We buy and process 480,000 tons of milk every year in Pakistan, and it's, it's a very complex market. In 2010, we realized that our transit losses accounted for 365 tons of milk. There was something to be done, and we, we introduced there and implemented a milk district model so collection centers were implemented to allow the farmers to bring their milk um, as much as twice a day uh, in an environment where there was electricity and where chillers were in place because the electricity is quite rare in, the, in those remote areas. Losses were cut by four after the implementation of, of this model. Pascal also mentioned our numerous partnerships at Nestle, I'd briefly like to introduce, and it was briefly talked about, but the, the World Resource Institute protocol that we engaged in as well. Uh, so this protocol is meant uh, to help the countries, the organization, but also the private entities like Nestle quantify food loss and waste in a consistent manner. Uh, it, it is a multi-stakeholder effort, and you can see some of the names, the FAO, the UNEP, uh, EU Fusions, just to name a few, are part of the governance. Nestlé is contributing to the protocol and that last year we decided to pilot it for the same case of Pakistan, milk dairy chain and uh, we, just, we just finished and, and got the results uh, of this study. So in this complex supply chain we just really wanted to quantify the losses and waste all along the value chain from milk production uh, down to the consumption. So we mandated bio by Deloitte uh, to do that research for us, and they did that through bibliographic research, phone interviews inside our organization and even outside with experts, but also through a field visit. The first outcome of the study was a very detailed uh, value chain mapping. What you can see here is the upstream part of the value chain where we source milk from five different types of farmers. A quarter of the milk we source, and we actually buy, uh, I told you, 480,000 tons of milk from 180,000 uh, farmers. So a quarter of the milk comes from traditional farms, and um, the milk can be brought by the farmers directly to village milk centers, and will transit after some quality checks 
to chilling centers, but the milk could also transit through small duddies. Um, a lot less in percentage, but still large in volume. Milk goes through large, uh, larger entities like mega farms. They have up to 500 lactating animals. The traditional farmers only have one to 10 animals. So you see the difference of scale. Those mega farms could bring their milk directly to the factory gate, or it, it could go through supplier. Here you're seeing the difference in destination uh, that is also very key uh, for the protocol. Uh, we actually uh, identified where the losses for every part of the supply chain was going to, uh, if it was valorized going to animal feed, uh, or if it was just dumped and really get a, a big waste. So this is the results. The results are eloquent. In 2004, uh, an external report showed that up to 19% of the milk was lost. Um, even if the method that we used was really different, our results showed 1.4% losses all along the value chain. So from the farms, collecting centers, the factory, the supply chain after that down to the consumer level. And actually the consumer you don't even see because this is zero. They don't waste any dairy product in Pakistan. Uh, you see again the difference in, uh, in destination uh, here, what is lost and wasted at the strict sense in red and what is valorized. So the, the highest percentages, which are actually quite low for production site, uh, go to animal feed. This study allowed us to confirm that our, our milk model, this strict model, uh, does work and also comforted us in, in the methodology that we should repeat this, uh, this exercise also for other supply chain. To finish up with this case study, we are, are currently giving our feedback to the World Resource Institute on the protocol, and uh, the first version should be out by, by this fall. All the products we process are, of course, packed, and I can only reiterate what Stefan said this morning. Uh, the objective is to protect the product all along the shelf life throughout all the constraints that we know of the supply chain. And the second objective is to optimize the packaging as much as possible. But if you optimize too much and you start underpacking, then the environment, uh, environmental impact will raise substantially. So you create food waste, the impact is, is much higher. We use uh, in our development process the eco design tool Ecodex. So some of you may have seen in the booth, uh, you can go and see a demo of how it works to evaluate the env environmental performance of our packaging. Uh, to optimize further, we use new technologies, like you can see in this photo for fresh pasta. We use oxygen, oxygen scavengers uh, to extend the shelf life. Uh, we use portion packing, of course. We know this is very key for the consumer. And uh, here you have an example of a big bag for, for pet food. We first move in order to optimize the pack, we moved from plastic to paper bag, and then we realized it was creating waste. Uh, uh, it, during storage, during supply chain, there was a lot of breakage, so we had to move back to a, a woven polypropylene bag. Of course, we also use the traditional Tetra pack, and uh, Stefan explained very well how it retains uh, all the sensorial and the, the vitamins and fat uh, from being degraded. As Pascal also mentioned, uh, all our Nestle sites should not send any waste for disposal by 2020. The example you have here is uh, from a, a, a confectionery uh, factory in the UK, where waste is sent to biogas, and the biogas is then used to, to power our factory. We already, do, we already do that in 22 of our Nescafe factories, uh, where the coffee ground is also recovered uh, to use as, a, as energy feed. All these best practices are shared uh, in the format of a toolkit where the, the 72 factories that already achieved zero waste are, are sharing. And uh, we'd like this to accelerate the process and uh, creating uh, less waste and achieving the zero waste by 2020. Now, at the consumer level, we know this is a major issue, issue especially in our country, so we provide tools to help the consumers manage their shopping list first. If they scan the product, they can also have information on portion sizes, storage guidance, among a lot of other information. 
But of course, we also pay particular attention to date labeling to make sure that the difference between expiry date and best before is clearly understood. But we know that there is still a lot to do there, so that really to make the, the consumers understood the, the difference. We also looked at what else could we do uh, as new products to support the consumers wasting less of fresh food. Uh, these products were developed um, in that sense and actually advertised in that sense to support and tell the consumers, well, use your leftovers from your fridge and you can create some yeah, creative pieces uh, of milk. And this is what is done in Italy uh, and, and quite successfully, actually. Finally, the, the consumers, they start with our employees. We engage in numerous awareness campaigns. <coughs> and actually, in this building, we managed to lower by a third uh, the amount of food waste that was created in our restaurant. Uh, by encouraging our employees to take appropriate portion size, uh, by allowing them to buy the leftover from the canteen. Shortly, in some R&D centers, we'll try to implement the doggy bags. Uh, so this is definitely something that is key for us. Uh, in June, coming up in June, we are launching a, a challenge again uh, across six different centers, where we will ask people to measure their waste and we'll give them uh, tips and tricks. Actually, we're using the UNEP uh, Eat. Uh, it's safe uh, toolkit and all the tips that have been developed there. So we are really thankful for all these, these means to help us uh, go faster and, and, uh, and improve. So, so far we had a lot of participants that have subscribed. So it shows that really people are engaging in, in this type of activity. So the journey is far from being finished. And I hope these examples were inspiring. So we're not working internally to share uh, better all these best practices across markets, across businesses, and to accelerate the reduction towards zero food waste age. Thank you very much. <laughs>